class, Professor Cook here. This is our, going to be our last set of slides and our last set of lectures and content for this semester, Gender and Sexuality and Sexual Orientation, I should add in here as well. You'll notice uh, your textbook covers this slightly differently. Both are important, uh, and also I think the video Growing Up Trans is important, so I've assigned the full video. If you don't have time to watch the entire video, I still would say watch at least half of it and answer the questions. I think it's worthwhile, and that's why I've given extra points for this week's in-class assignment um, on that video. Okay, so before you get to that, though, let's kind of go over some basic terms and some basic understandings that are a little different in sociology compared to popular knowledge and other disciplines. So in sociology, these three concepts, sex, sexuality, and gender, are all different from one another. And the tendency in our sort of everyday understanding is to understand gender and sex as the same thing. And then we make associations between those two identities and sexual orientation or who an individual would be attracted to. Okay, and in re in reality and in, in um, sociology, we understand all of those things as separate, but possibly related um, concepts or understandings. Okay, so sex here would, we're talking about the chromosomes and uh, genitalia that we would usually use to assign someone to the category of male or female. In reality, sex is a little more complicated than that as an identity, and you can have individuals who have chromosomes and genitalia of both male and female um, identities, and those people are known as intersex. Generally, at birth, you are assigned to one or the other, male or female, as a sex category, although there's an increasing uh, movement to allow intersex people to not have to be forced into one or the other category and to be raised as intersex, um, just so that you're aware. Sexuality here refers to desire, sexual orientation, sexual preference, behavior and identity, so we're going to be holding on to those concepts till later and talking more about sex and gender as we begin this chapter. Gender, okay, gender is a social construct. So just as we talked about race as a social construct, gender for sociologists is a social construct, meaning we create gender as a category through our interactions, habits, practice, and history. There is nothing necessarily inherent about gender, okay? So yes, we are born with genitalia and chromosomes, but just because one of us is born with one set of genitalia, it doesn't necessarily mean I prefer the color pink or blue, okay? That is a gendered construction, okay? So these are social arrangements built around a sex category that tend to make themselves look invisible, in other words, we tend to assume that women are interested in makeup and jewelry and shoes and shopping, when in reality that's, that's a behavior that's been taught and socialized into us. That's not inherent, if you will. Okay, it doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Sociologists are not saying that your sex traits and hormones don't matter. We're saying that uh, how we understand what a gender is, is a construction. Hopefully that made sense. Okay. Uh, this little excerpt from your textbook is talking about changing gender roles over time. Um, gender roles are the behaviors that we would expect of a man or a woman, and these overall have much more to do with social interaction and socialization than with biology. Okay, so there's, like I said, there's not really anything inherent to um, our chromosomes and our genitalia that make us want to do different jobs, that, that comes later. That's the socialization aspect. Okay. All right, we, we kind of already covered this, so I'm going to kind of keep moving forward. Um, there's actually evidence to suggest that we have at least five sex categories, and that's kind of an interesting article out of biology in the last 20 years, maybe more like 30 years, um, that it's, it's more realistic to actually conceive of ourselves as having five different sex categories, not gender here, now sex. Um, but that's, we don't have to get too far down that rabbit hole of um, 
the sociology of scientific knowledge making. Instead, I want to focus a little bit on gender and how early this uh, social construction and this socialization begins. It actually begins before we're born. Um, if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen people announce um, online or or maybe you know through through old-fashioned cards, hey, we're having a boy, we're having a girl, and the the person who's having the baby is still pregnant. Um, well, or the quote-unquote gender reveal parties. Those drive um, sociologists and scholars of, of gender and sexuality a little bit bonkers because really the individual's gender identity is up to them. So we don't know with a fetus or with an unborn baby, we don't really know what their gender will be. From an ultrasound, we can maybe um, make assumptions that, by the way, are not 100% about what genitalia that child will be born with and what sex category they'll be assigned. And if you're planning on assigning them the corresponding gender category, um, when you see the genitalia on the ultrasound, then you can say, hey, everybody, we are planning on assigning our unborn fetus the gender of boy or the gender of girl. But that's a lot to put on a card, and I get that. <laughs> so instead, I would say you're having a sex, an assumed sex, category assignment reveal party, which is still a lot. Um, <laughs> one, one pop culture example that I think got this really, did this really well in recent um, memory is Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I don't know if anyone watches that, uh, but they actually had an episode all about uh, just this difference between a sex reveal and a gender reveal party. And I thought they had integrated it in a really cute way. So I won't I won't ruin the episode for you, but they actually made that distinction and that shows does a pretty good job of trying to respect those boundaries. Okay. But what happens after we're born? After we're born, we from the time we are out, right, we are being socialized. Um and like I said, maybe even before. In the past, uh it was pretty easy to go shopping um for toys by gender. Target has now removed, Target and other stores have removed sort of the gendered labels, but you can still see the color coding here in terms of which toys are probably quote unquote supposed to be for boys and which are supposed to be for girls. Uh, when in reality, these are just toys. There's nothing about these toys that prohibits boys from playing with them, and there's nothing about these toys that prohibits girls from playing with them, except what we teach kids, right, and who they're, who, um, who is advertising what to them. Also, the association of these colors, pink for girls and blue for boys, is only about 100 years old in the U.S. It actually used to be the opposite. Pink used to be considered a masculine or manly color because it was closer to red, and blue was considered a more feminine or delicate color. So just the idea that those two color associations can shift for us in a relatively short period of time shows you just how much this is a social construction. I'm going to take a minute away from the slides here to show you the link in the bottom of the um, slides here. And I've got this pulled up. Nope, that's for later. Okay, I'm going to Pinterest. Don't, don't judge me. I don't know why it's telling you to search for Misha Collins. I've, I That's weird. Um, but what I'm showing you here is a board called Pointlessly Gendered Products, and this is from a blog called Sociological Images, and I really like their blog, and I, I find a lot of interesting and thoughtful ideas on them, but what you can see if you scroll through this is kind of funny, is different products that are gendered and marketed toward um, men or women, boys or girls, when really it's the same product. Like, do we really need to have men's comb, right? Um, does this does this only work for men? Uh, pretty sure this would work for anybody with with hair of that kind of thickness, right? I don't think there's anything to prevent me from using that comb comb, uh, so to speak, which is kind of funny. Um, so it's it gets kind of hilarious the more you go down here and and look at these various men's coloring book. Okay men's shampoo and I have to admit my husband bought men's shampoo and I was like why 
<laughs> um, and I, I think it probably had something to do with the, the smell. I don't know, but I just thought it was funny. Maybe it was on sale. That's my guess, actually, is he probably bought whatever was cheaper if I'm being, if I'm being uh, a little more uh, thoughtful about him. But happy man birthday. Did you know that man birthdays are different from woman birthdays? Okay. Um, so it's kind of funny to think about this because what's interesting here is um, what are assumptions are built into that marketing. So the one that I noticed um, right away was the Coke versus Diet Coke. So you can kind of see that it looks like the regular Coke is being marketed toward men or boys and the Diet Coke is being marketed toward women. So what does this mean about assumptions about body size that are built into gender, et cetera? Kind of problematic. So that, that gendering is a marketing ploy that begins early and continues throughout the rest of our lives. If we were in class, we would have a bigger discussion about toys and gender, and we would do this as a class, but as we're here, I'll just kind of march through it. Counterintuitively, in, in other words, counter what we would expect, toys are actually becoming more gendered even as gender roles open up for women and become more equal between women and men. I'm going to say that again. Counterintuitively, or counter what we would expect, toys are becoming more gendered or more geared towards specific genders in the past 30 to 40 years even as gender roles start to become more equal and open up for women and for men, but more for women, I would argue. And um, we'll get to that in a minute. So one sort of point of evidence for this is looking at Lego ads. And this, this one is from 1980. This is a little girl, but she's wearing very gender neutral clothes. And you can see Legos from back in the day when they were just different rectangles and squares and blocks and we were real real excited to have a window or a wheel right that's about as fancy as legos got i think they had like a space shuttle set that was pretty sweet but none of this like star wars one little specific piece or you can't build the whole set right and certainly nothing that looked like a barbie doll this comes from lego friends uh, and this is not a lego ad this is a lego ad on the on the left here on the right here, this is a, a magazine cover talking about this, but if you look at this toy, it's interesting because the little yellow head that she's holding is what Lego people look like pretty much for a really long time. And then you can see with this shift in marketing Lego figures, they're really going, they're looking to interest more girls into purchasing Legos. And what kind of in what kind of messages is this telling young girls, right? If this is sort of a, an image of what you should be like as an adult, you can see that she's permanently got makeup on her face, right? She is a normative um, Western definition of beauty, right? She's thin, she's tall, her head is disproportionately big, her eyes are disproportionately big. Unfortunately, she can't smell anything because it looks like she's missing a nose here. Um, but just more seriously, she's also, her version of beauty is also raced and classed, right? Because she's got blonde hair, blue eyes, kind of, and light skin, uh, suggesting sort of this specific kind of female beauty, right? That is associated with a, with a small number of people, right? There's also sexual um, suggestions here with the short skirt and the fact that she's got a little bit of breasts happening. So you can consider what this ad says to girls versus this ad, right? This is suggesting creativity, right? You don't have to be a sexual object. This is really kind of taking that sexual objectification to the next level. This ad says you can be anything that you want as long as you meet society's ideal of sexy and beautiful. Okay, so back to um, these concepts again. For us, for our for exam and quiz purposes, sex are the biological characteristics with which we're born. Chromosomes, anatomy, hormones, usually binary, male, female. Gender are the attitudes and behaviors that we learn. Okay. So here's another image from that comes from that sociological images board. 
that looks at um, specific products that are gendered or, or they're pink, right? They're marketed toward girls. And what do you notice about these? These are also all sort of domestic chores that we would associate with women's work, quote unquote, or housewives, right? Um, although last time I checked, everyone needs to know how to <laughs> clean their house, wash their clothes, and cook, right? And a few years ago, you may have seen this um, Easy Bake Oven got in trouble, or not got in trouble, but someone lobbied Easy Bake Oven to make a non-pink oven because there was a little boy who really wanted one. I mean, there's nothing wrong with him using a pink one, but um, they started this whole campaign to try to get that company to make a different colored oven to kind of appeal to, to um, boys as well. Okay, so breaking down gender a little more Specifically, um, we as individuals have a gender identity. We are socialized into performing specific gender roles. And unfortunately, we're judged and based um, microaggressed sometimes based on gender stereotypes. So gender identity is how I think of myself, whether I'm male or female, right? How I under understand myself inside my mind, which can match my appearance, but doesn't have to. Gender roles are those characteristics and feelings and behaviors that we might expect of women and men, right? So as a, as a woman, and I know I've told you I'm a mom, I have kids, but even if I didn't, I remember this. Before I had children, I was expected to know how to care for babies and children just sort of automatically. I was expected to know how to cook even when I didn't because I was a woman, right? And the same sorts of attitudes were not were not um, expressed for my husband. He was not expected to know how to care for children or babies or to know how to cook, and he did because he had younger siblings. So it's kind of interesting to think about that. Um, all right, gender stereotypes are overgeneralized expectations. So these are things that are beyond what we would consider reasonable, and they're sort of treating an individual like a category that is not necessarily true. So a gender role would be something like um, we expect women to care about children and children's welfare. That's reasonable because we associate, associate that with the mother role. A gender stereotype is a little different. A gender stereotype is all women uh, are bad drivers. Okay, so that's a stereotype versus a role versus an expectation. Okay, I want to take a little detour again here to um, the gender unicorn. Some of you may have seen this. Hopefully this is working. Uh, some of you may have seen this in other classes. I'm not going to ask you to memorize all of these, but I like this graphic because it helps explain the different ways we can understand sex and gender and attraction. Okay, so again, gender identity is this the unicorn kind of thinking about how do they perceive themselves. So this, I like the scalars here too, kind of suggesting if you're a woman, you can feel extremely feminine or you can feel less, less womanly, if you will. And if you're a man, similar thing. And then you can also, of course, be a person who identifies as a gender, non-binary or gender fluid, which are different things. Okay. Um, I have a friend who identifies as non-binary. They use they, them pronouns. Um, and some days they dress in a way their expression is very feminine. And some days their expression is very masculine. It depends on what they feel like doing that day. Okay, so non-binary individual might identify somewhere here, but then their expression could be consistently feminine, consistently masculine, or other, androgynous or some other gender expression. I have another contact who also identifies as non-binary but expresses themselves in a very feminine um, way in terms of their dress. So expression is this dotted line here on the outside. This is what we show other people, right? And so we know that some individuals, especially some individuals who may be transgender, may identify as female, but they're expressing themselves as masculine 
because they maybe are not um, out of the closet yet as a transgender person or they have to protect their true identity for in order to be safe and protect themselves, okay? We'll get more into that later. Sex assigned at birth. Again, this is about your genitalia, your chromosomes, your hormones. Usually that's female, male, but can also be other intersex. Then there's two hearts here on the unicorn. The yellow heart, I guess that's yellow or orange, um, is indicating who that person feels sexual attraction or physical attraction to. And then the red heart is symbolizing emotional attraction. Okay, so you can you can be a person who experiences emotional attraction and not sexual attraction. That person might consider themselves to be asexual. Or you can be a person who experiences physical attraction, but not emotional attraction. And that person might identify as aromantic. Okay, this is a lot. It's a lot of terms. I understand that. I'm not going to try to be super tricky, but I do want you to understand the difference between gender identity, gender expression, sex, and attraction. Okay, sometimes these things line up. Sometimes they do not. So our expectations in society are that a person is born of a specific sex, let's say female. They're assigned a gender, let's say female or woman. And we assume, okay, you are born with woman parts, you identify as a woman, you express as a woman, and you are attracted to men. That's kind of the basic script we have, and then reverse it for men, right? You're born with male parts, you identify as a man, and you are attracted to women. But that set of assumptions is just that. It's a set of assumptions. So for an individual, right, any of those can be different. In other words, sex does not equal gender. Gender does not equal attraction. Okay, those can all diverge. Okay, so a person whose sex matches their gender identity, we, most of us, not all of us, but most of us in society, we would be referred to as cisgender, C-I-S gender. If our gender identity does not match our sex assigned at birth, we may identify as transgender. Okay, And we will talk more about that in a little bit. So hopefully that was helpful. To wrap up with today's lecture, let's do a little bit of practice. So your options um, for answering these questions are either um, sex, gender, gender identity, gender role, or gender stereotyping. Okay. So let's try the first one. Emma believes that it is the mother's responsibility to care for the children. She believes it is the mother's responsibility to care for the children. This is meant to indicate gender role. This is gender role and not gender stereotyping because she's not necessarily assuming all women want to be mothers. That would be a stereotype. Okay, This is a fairly reasonable expectation that if you're a mother, society would say you're supposed to take care of your children. Okay, I'll be a little more specific than that on the exam. Stephen was born with a penis and testes. This is indicating sex, right? The person's genitalia, sex. Let's try this one. Three-year-old Valerie announces she will be a cowboy when she grows up. Okay, three-year-old Valerie says she will be a cowboy when she grows up. So assuming she understands that a cowboy and a cowgirl are different, this is supposed to reflect gender identity. Valerie is thinking of her own identity and identifying as a boy to some extent. Okay, but she is three, so we don't really know if that's going to be persistent, right? If it is, Valerie may end up being a transgender man, right? If she, if those, if he, then we would change pronouns. Um, okay, that's a little different scenario. Let's try the last one. John believes that all females are alike and not qualified to be president. Oh, John. John, 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 John. We need to have a talk. Okay, this one is obviously reflecting gender stereotype. So John's assuming that all women are the same, and something about that means we're not qualified to be president. 
Okay, so we will stop here for now and we'll pick up next time. Thanks.